Okay. I'm going to start this off by saying I have really been looking forward to making this installment of the series. Why? Two reasons. One, this was one of my favourite movie franchises from my early childhood. And two, this was the franchise that inspired the concept of SS5's movie memories. I have a lot to go over with this franchise. The first one, the obnoxious number of sequels, the TV specials, Scrat's brief cameo in that one Family Guy episode, lots to cover. But before I start, I need to explain why I chose this specific day to release this video. Because I'm using it as a way of honouring the 20th anniversary of the Ice Age franchise. Yep, 20 years ago today, the first movie was released, and it kickstarted a more or less great legacy for the now defunct Blue Sky Studios. So now, we will dive into everything. Except Adventures of Buckwild. I won't be covering that because I haven't seen it because Disney Plus is complete shit. Okay, enough wasting time, let's get started. Now my history with this franchise is actually quite strange, as for some reason I grew up watching the third movie more than the previous two. That's not to say we didn't watch the previous two at all, we did own them on DVD when this midget box set was still being mass produced, but it was always the third movie I ended up watching. As a result, the first and second movies were quickly erased from my mind. I was around six years old at the time the fourth movie was released, and my first exposure to it was when I happened to witness the opening scene being played on a 3D TV at Curry's PC World. A few weeks later, I saw the fourth movie in cinemas, and six-year-old me living a life of being delusional towards criticism thought it was a step up from the third movie in every regard. I was ten when I heard of the fifth movie through a TV spot I happened to witness, and I'll be honest, I wasn't all that excited. The only thing I thought while watching that spot was Christ, another one?! I didn't see the movie in cinemas, or purchase the DVD when it was released. The only thing I saw connected to Ice Age 5 when it was released was that hilarious Minecraft parody of the movie. And you know, that video still has the same charm it used to back then. Oh, I was so afraid you'd ruin our special day. Does that seem like something I'd do? Yes. Now let's skip to 2021. It was a cloudy summer's evening, I was working on something I quietly started production on, when my sister decided to re-watch Ice Age 3. And for the first time in five years, I came back to this franchise. And from there, I was on an absolute Ice Age kick for the rest of the year. And I don't think it's hard to see. I mean, why do you think one of my running jokes in my YCPs is something relating to Ice Age in some way or another? Why do you think I referenced Ice Age 5 in my Wooden Railway video? Why do you think I blatantly used Chasing the Sun in my famous Shadow Realm video? Both of them. Okay, back on track. It was during this kick when I saw an opportunity to rewatch all of these movies and have a look at Ice Age 5 for the first time, which eventually led to this series idea. Also during this kick, there were suddenly moments where I just couldn't escape from this franchise, which I suppose was a good thing because I'd just gone back in touch with a franchise I hadn't viewed in years? But believe me, you would not believe how many times this franchise would keep randomly reappearing. I'm fairly certain you guys know how I'm going to talk about these movies, unless you haven't seen the first two episodes. If not, then hopefully I'll give you guys a decent understanding on how I'll talk about these movies as we go along. As always, I've re-watched all of these movies in preparation for this video, and this will be based around my opinion and nobody else's. I'll start this off by saying that this was one of the Ice Age movies I have very few memories of watching, and I honestly regret that. Going into my rewatch, I thought it was just going to be me shunning the dated animation, but thank god that wasn't the case, as this is a brilliant movie. To begin, characters. We'll start with Manfred, or more famously known as Manny. I just love how much of a cynical, grouchy persona he has, and Ray Romano absolutely outdid himself with emphasising that. Not to mention how Manny is the most developed character, not just in this movie, but very much all the movies in the franchise. 
even if part of his existence is mainly for this running joke in the first four movies. I'm not fat. I'm not fat. I'm not fat. I'm not fat. Then we got Sid. Sid! Who's an excellent choice as a contrast to Manny within their first scenes. And not to mention how most of his idiotic character trait works for the most part. While on my rewatch, John Leguizamo's voice for Sid was a bit irritating, I think it kind of works to an extent. And to finish the main three, there's Diego, who I love as the most maniacal of the three. And also for the excellent character arc he has regarding his relationships with his pack, Manny and Sid, and especially his arc of growing fond of Rashan. My favourite scene with Diego is hands down the scene where he first meets Manny and Sid. Whatever he says to them is just a joy to watch. Especially with Dennis Leary's performance here. And what would be a video about Ice Age without a mention of Scrat? When I was younger, he was, not surprisingly, my favourite character. And while he still is enjoyable to watch, when I was re-watching these movies last year and in January, another character took the title of my favourite. But I'll talk about that character later. As for this movie's story, do you know what I think about when I think of the story of Ice Age 1? That Brum episode only modified in places. Basically, three friends band together to help return a child to his family. Not too conceptually different from the Brum episode, but it is executionally different, in the sense that there are three main characters instead of one, and more obstacles. I will say that the best aspect of this movie is how it handled its serious moments, using no words, and oftentimes, low and slow music. This is how you make an excellent show don't tell scene. Although, on this latest rewatch, it was apparent to me that certain aspects weren't as good as they could have been. One of those, obviously, being the animation. I get that this was 2002, I get that they probably rendered this on an old computer, and I get that I'm saying this as someone who has watched this 20 years later, but are you seriously going to look me in the eye and tell me that this doesn't look dated? Another nitpick I had on this latest rewatch was a certain thing I wasn't fond of. One little word. Foreshadowing. But despite those lows, the highs of this movie are amazingly high. I would definitely recommend giving this one a watch. Even if the movie doesn't look that good, it's still worth a watch for its great writing and fantastic character arcs. I'm gonna flat out say that this was the Ice Age movie I remembered the least about before my rewatch. But after my rewatch, I was honestly deciding on whether to call this the best of the franchise. So to begin, the characters. Just like the previous episode, I'll be going over the existing characters' arcs before going over the new ones. Diego's arc is getting over his fear of water, and Manny's arc is realising that he isn't the final mammoth in existence. Which brings us to the main new character of this movie, Ellie. Before my rewatch, I thought that she was just the obligatory love interest and nothing more. But during my rewatch, I said to myself, Damn! Because, my god is she in depth! Ellie's role in this movie is basically the adorable idiot who is under the delusion that she's a possum. Me? Don't be ridiculous. I'm not a mammoth, I'm a possum. Leading to an incredible scene where we understand why. It turns out she was separated from her own herd, and while taking refuge under a willow tree, she gets taken in by a mother possum. And from there, Ellie begins her belief that she is a possum, which is followed up by using no words to show that Ellie has accepted being a mammoth. I absolutely love this on my rewatch. Queen Latifah also did a brilliant job voicing Ellie. I don't know if it's obvious to anyone else, but to me there are very obvious moments where Queen is really enjoying herself. Need I say more? Alongside her are the Possum Twins Crash and Eddie, voiced by Sean William Scott and Josh Peck respectively. And the best way to describe them is that they're basically Sid divided by two, but their personalities are Sid's times ten. So what's Ice Age 2 about? This movie is basically a life or death escape movie in which the main three, or six by the end, have to escape to safety before the dam breaks. 
RPG sounds familiar, doesn't it? I'd say the best scene in the movie is the final climax, purely for how serious it's presented. And just like the previous movie, this one does have its fair share of silent moments whenever there's a scene that needs to be taken absolutely seriously. I will say as well that this movie was marketed well in some areas. It wasn't marketed as well as Day of the Diesels in my opinion, but it was still marketed pretty well, even going so far as to make Scrat cameo in an episode of Family Guy. I definitely recommend giving this one a good watch, although I would advise you to skip a few scenes, as some of them are put off by not so good writing or are just borderline strange. There's your... uh... butt? What about it? It's... big? But aside from those, I do recommend giving this movie a watch. I'm a possum. Considering this was the Ice Age movie I watched the most as a kid, I was expecting to really enjoy my rewatch of this movie. And did I? Yep. There were so many things I enjoyed about this movie. So we'll start by going over the things that happened to the existing characters. This is the main focus for the first 20 or so minutes. Manny and Ellie are expecting their first child. Crash and Ellie actually serve a proper purpose during the final climax. And Diego was almost written off the herd. I swear they were intending on writing him out in this movie with all the Diego's leaving malarkey in the first act. Although, he wasn't written out in the end because he's still got to be paired up with an obligatory love interest in the next movie. Ah, I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, let's move on to the main new character of this movie, Buck. He was absolutely the highlight of this movie, hands down. From his jokes to his backstory, he was fantastic. And I feel like he wouldn't have been as great as he was if Simon Pegg wasn't voicing him here. Simon absolutely owns the part. Don't you see? We're all gonna die. Oh, and yes, Peaches was introduced too, but I'll get back to her later. Shockingly, I didn't mention any of the characters getting obligatory love interest in that analysis of the characters in the movie. Although one character did get an obligatory love interest, and. <sighs> it's Scrat. Admittedly, while his and Scratte's feud over the acorn did provide some entertainment, such as this gem of a scene... <laughs> some of their scenes seem like they were made for the National Cringe Day Festival of 2009. So what's Ice Age 3 about? In this movie, Manny and Ellie are expecting their first child, which causes Diego to consider leaving, and Sid thinks of making a new herd with all this speculation, which results in him kidnapping some supposedly abandoned eggs, which hatch into baby T-Rexes, and when their real mother comes, she takes them and Sid to the subterranean dino jungle. So it's up to Manny and the rest of the herd to find him. On the surface, it sounds like something that's been done before, but it was executed quite well, I'll give it that. Now what do I especially like about this movie? Well, I can say that this is the most visually amazing Ice Age movie. The following two movies have some great animation too, don't get me wrong, but they just can't match the breathtaking lighting and stunning weather effects of this movie. People have pinpointed Ice Age 2 as a step up from the first one in terms of animation. Ice Age 3 looks like Sodor's Legend of the Lost Treasure compared to its predecessors. There's also some very good humour here as well, ranging from decently used pop culture references to some very subtle adult humour, such as the sucking on helium joke, and this scene that I'm surprised nobody's edited in this way. And there are some incredible show don't tell moments scattered in as well, although this time, it's not just for the serious moments. They're also used in the generally heartwarming or tear-jerking scenes, such as Peaches' birth and when Sid says goodbye to his kids. Not to mention, this movie ends perfectly, with a very well detailed snowflake falling, Ellie's heartwarming line, Baby Peach is doing her little and the camera zooming out on the herd which now comprises seven. Oh and just one more thing before the negatives, the song at the end. It's a fairly decent cover of Walk the Dinosaur, and what I never knew for years was that this cover was being sung by Queen Latifah. 
So if you want to stretch it out, you could say that this cover's basically being sung by Ellie, which could have worked in the credits if pulled off correctly. If there's one thing I wasn't particularly fond of on this latest rewatch, it would be the first third of the movie. While it does provide some good elements, it's mainly just Sid trying to be a parent of three baby dinos. I can, however, say with confidence that the latter two thirds make up for it. I absolutely love this movie. I would call it the best, if the first third wasn't as underwhelming as it was. But oh well, it is what it is, and the rest of the movie is damn fantastic. Now before I talk about this movie, I just want to bring something off topic up. While this is the franchise as a whole's 20th anniversary, it's also this movie's 10th. What a bizarre coincidence. Okay, I'll stop wasting time with the unimportant details now. Before my rewatch, there was only a very minimal amount of things I remembered about this movie. Those being the scene with the sirens, the falls, Shira's introduction, and the infamous I wish you weren't my father. Scene. I then rewatched this movie last summer, and I was delighted to not only feel a nostalgia rush, but also I found so many things I never would have picked up on as a six year old. Then I rewatched this right after the production of the Cars video wrapped, and having seen past reviews beforehand, I came to the conclusion that it was fine. Not incredible by any stretch of the imagination, but just watchable. So let's address the characters. To begin, Manny's become an overprotective father, in contrast to Ellie, who's just all... Sid's whole plot is reuniting with his grandmother, Diego's reusing Manny's role from the second movie, and after Crash and Eddie contributed a great deal in the last movie, they now contribute nothing. Anyway, before starting the new characters, I want to go over not only my favourite of this movie, but also my favourite of the franchise. Peaches. I have three reasons as to why Peaches of all characters is my favourite. One, she looks pretty unique. I don't know about you, but she really stands out amongst Manny and Ellie to me. Two, Kiki Palmer did an absolutely excellent job voicing Peaches. I swear she couldn't sound more genuine than this in her performance. There is nothing bad about being part of my family. I like hanging by my tail. And the third reason is because she had some very clever character development. Let me explain. When Peaches is first seen in this movie, she's shown to be energetic, eager to interact with others, and absolutely rebellious. Trust me, we've all been through that phase like her. Because she was presented like this, the audience is most likely meant to turn against her and side with Manny. But when she gets her go-ahead with, as the internet calls this group, the Brat Pack, she actually uses her father's strictness and calls them out for being just as rebellious and reckless as she was, and the audience actually sees her as not that bad. That was incredibly clever. While we're on the subject of Peaches, we should start off the new characters with Lewis. He's basically the contrast to Peaches, and that's basically it. Although I did like how much risk he was willing to take to ensure Peaches was safe from the pirates. God, I love that scene. Then there's Sid's grandmother the most unfunny character of the franchise. She literally has one or two jokes, by which I mean calling for precious. Now let's get into the pirates. I'll only go over two of them in detail if that's okay, starting with Shira. And I'm just gonna say, Peaches is my favorite character of the franchise, and Shira is an extremely close second. While I prefer Peaches for her character traits and development, I just love Shira for her personality. She has some of the best lines in the film, and Jennifer Lopez's performance absolutely says everything. Oh, you almost made it! I don't fight girls. <laughs> I can see why. Thanks, Shira. I love you. While she does suffer from being an obligatory love interest, this time, I can confidently say that I don't care. Then we got Captain Gut who was a pretty good villain. Peter Dinklage really outdid himself with trying to sound sarcastic and menacing when it was required. As for the other pirates in the Brat Pack, we can skip them. The former having little to talk about, and the latter only existing because this movie desperately needs celebrity voices. I mean, let's see, we've got Nicki Minaj, 
Heather Morris and Drake, voicing Steffi, Katie and Ethan respectively. If that doesn't shriek out the need for celebrities, I don't know what does. And what about this one? She barely got more than one line and never appeared again. Okay, let's just go over the story. After being swept far away from the continent, Manny, Sid and Diego have to find a way back, while also trying to battle off the pirates. At the same time, Ellie leads the entire population of the continent to the land bridge, only to discover that the land bridge has gone bye-bye at the end. This is one of the weaker stories, but at least the visuals and scraps plot make up for it. Regarding likes and dislikes, there were a few moments that clicked with me, such as the pre-mentioned Peach's development, and the fact that they were trying to go back to basics and have the A-plot revolve around the main three. If there was one thing, or even a good chunk of things that I didn't really like, was that some of the scenes didn't go on for as long as I would have liked, and also the scene with the sirens. Even as a six-year-old watching this in the cinema, after that scene had finished, I was just left thinking, What the hell is that? And some of the lines just made me cringe. Diego. Shira? I wanted to come with you. <laughs> not to mention, the first 10 minutes are just not interesting. Think about it. The first 10 minutes is mostly about Peaches rebelling against Manny, and after they argue, they get separated. Finding Nemo, anyone? While I didn't really appreciate this movie as much as I did when I was six, and even my rewatch last summer, I could still at least sit through it. I mean, believe me, this movie is nothing compared to the next movie, and this next instalment is the absolute best of the Ice Age franchise. Oh, by the way, I was being sarcastic. Believe it or not, there was actually a time when I was interested to see what Ice Age 5 had to offer. And during my kick last summer, seeing as I hadn't yet seen it at the time, I wanted to get a basic understanding of this movie. I consulted Wikipedia for the plot, I consulted the official Ice Age wiki for the new characters, the cast, important plot points, you name it. I eventually purchased the DVD so that I could sample my first viewing of the movie, keeping my hopes high, and after I watched it, I came to the conclusion that... This was the most awful, angering, questionable, confusing, crap sack I've ever seen. Yeah, go fly a kite, Misty Island Rescue. This is undoubtedly the worst film I've ever seen. I remember my first viewing of this movie, and I was persistently screaming and yelling at every single scene. Let's just get the characters out of the way. There's Manny, whose character development from the fourth movie has been temporarily erased. Diego has the most nothing role in the whole movie, along with Shira. Sid's still looking for an obligatory love interest, because Christ forbid we can actually find something different to do with this character. Buck's been absolutely ruined, and not even Peaches, whose development from the fourth movie, which actually remains consistent here, can save this movie. Let's just address the two new main characters, starting with Brooke. And I'm going to be very biased. I don't hate her. She doesn't entirely feel like she was written in the last minute just to give Jessie J someone to voice. I quite liked her youthful, quirky persona, and when she interacts with Sid, it feels quite fun. But do you want to know what the really sad thing about her is? She's the only good thing about this movie. She definitely has the honour of being the best new character in this movie. The dishonour of the worst new character in this movie has to go to... <sighs> I can feel your heart beating! Okay! I have three reasons as to why I DESPISE Julian! Number one, he appears, quite literally, out of nowhere! This movie is seriously implying that he was a pre-existing character at the time, when in fact, he wasn't. Well, to be fair, Lewis had the same problem. Number two... HE IS DOWNRIGHT INSUFFERABLE! Oh, hey, bro, Dad. You here to rock out? Ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. Off to hang myself. Off and left. 
literally all of his lines are awful. From the way Adam Devine performs most of them, to the way that they're written. In fact, from this shot alone, it looks like Peaches is enjoying his crap as much as I am. Admittedly, he does have a moment in the film, but it just feels like it was shoved in so that we could like him, even though the damage had already been done. He was so insufferable to the point that I was actually cheering with excitement when Manny hit him with the puck. I mean, I could write in a better character that's less annoying and serves more than one purpose, who all the while looks like this monstrosity! And number three, Julian literally only exists just so Peaches can be active in this movie somehow. I swear they had no other ideas. They just wanted to write Julian in so Peaches could be here. Well, how else is Peaches supposed to have a role in this movie? Well, it's dead simple. You find a way to make Peaches the lead character. It can be done. While characters do drive this movie off in some way or another, the story is another contributing factor in that regard. While the main plot with the meteor shower is mediocre, do you know what ruins this movie? The convoluted side plots. There are so many side plots in this movie that I'll have to do my best to list them off. So here we go. We have Peaches getting married to Julian, which makes Manny upset. Speaking of Manny, we have a plot regarding him letting the date of his anniversary fly over his head. Whoopsie daisy. We have Diego and Shira, who are considering having kids of their own, but are unsure as to why kids are terrified of them. We have Buck feuding with some dino birds, who can talk, which contradicts how dinos couldn't talk in the third movie. We have Sid, who's still looking for a love interest, for God's sake. We have a plot regarding a bunch of animals who can stay young in this fentanyl drug trip geotopia place. We have Sprat dicking around in a UFO of all things. We have Diego and Shira, who are considering having kids of their own. Oh wait, I already mentioned that. See, there's just so much going on in this movie that it's near impossible to keep up with it all. Not only that, but some of these plots don't even last that long at all. Diego and Shira's plot lasts a maximum of 28 seconds. I timed it too. I really don't think I could go into what I like and dislike overall. I just don't know what else there is to say about this absolute... COCK! <sighs> Before I have a heart attack, let's just go over the TV specials. <sighs> Now before I begin, I just want to say some of you may have already seen me talk about this TV special. In other words, most of what I say here will just be a large repeat of that DVD review I made months ago. To put it bluntly, this TV special is just plain rushed. Let's begin with the characters. Manny and Ellie contribute nothing worth talking about, nor do Diego, Crash or Eddie. So I suppose we could say the lead characters of this TV special are Sid and Peaches. I'm going to flat out say, I don't like them in this TV special. I know in terms of Peaches that sounds contradictory of me to say, seeing as she is my favourite character of the franchise, but even the best can be ruined sometimes. In this case, she's the typical kid who has a firm belief in Santa. Speaking of which, I don't want to talk about Santa because he's basically how you'd expect him to be in a TV special like this. But the character I do want to talk about is Prancer. I absolutely love how cocky he is. I also adored how he broke the barrier of constantly having Rudolph as the face of Santa's reindeers over and over and over and over again. Although my one gripe with him is they didn't use his cockiness to its advantage in my opinion. So what's this TV special's story? When Sid accidentally causes Manny's Herloom Christmas Rock to Bottom text... Seriously, what did you think was going ...and ends up on Santa's naughty list, he leads a hilarious quest to the North Pole to make things right and ends up making things much worse. So now it's up to Manny and the rest of the herd to band together to save Christmas for the whole world. I literally read out the blurb of the DVD to summarise the plot. You're most welcome. The only positive things I could ever find in this TV special were the animation and the scenes with Scrap. That's it. The rest of the special just doesn't go on for that long at all and just shoves plot elements down our throats and never comes back to them. 
Would you like to stand on top of my traditional Christmas Lindor chocolate? No thanks. Not to mention, I should have pointed this out in my DVD review, but why is the world in its current continental state when we see Scrap forming the continents in the next movie? It implies that the crack up had happened prior to the events of this TV special. So by that logic, Continental Drift takes place before A Mammoth Christmas, which obviously can't make sense as we see Peaches as roughly 7 or 8 in this TV special, and then we see her as 15 or 16 in Continental Drift, DURING the Continental Crack Up! So by that logic, there is no logic! Now let me make one thing clear. I don't hate the fact that Christmas is a thing in this franchise. In fact, I think it's incredibly clever and a way of showing us that this isn't supposed to represent the actual Ice Age. What I do have a problem with, however, is a rushed, lacklustre story with poorly written characters, a missed potential new character, and scenes that had me shocked that I only passed the 10 minute mark. It was clear that they were only thinking about the runtime rather than the quality with this TV special. I just don't feel like this was done as well as it could have been. Now I'm just going to say out loud, this was the only existing piece of Ice Age media I had no idea existed until my kick last summer, and after watching this TV special, I came to the conclusion that it was definitely better than A Mammoth Christmas. And that ain't saying much. Let's begin with the characters. Sid, Diego and Manny are, in a way, the leads of the movie. And you know how most of the characters contributed nothing in the last TV special? Well, alongside Ellie, Crash and Eddie, Peaches has joined them in contributing nothing. But that's understandable, so have a great day. Now let's address the main thing I adored in terms of characters. The fact they had the guts to bring back my boy Squint from the fourth movie. I like that a lot. So what's the story? Sid basically becomes a babysitter, Squint steals the eggs, and Sid, Diego and Manny have to find them, basically establishing that this was the first ever Easter egg hunt, which I am A-OK -okay with. If there were some things to like about this TV special, one would be that its runtime is significantly longer than A Mammoth Christmas, which is a definite improvement, and also the animation was quite nice. I was also quite fond of some of the continuity references here and there. Those are literally the only things I liked about this TV special. While Mammoth Christmas was very clearly ruined by rushed storytelling, The Great Escapade is just... boring. It's literally just your typical Easter Egg Hunt storyline. Not much to say. Also, I have to deduct points for 1. Crash and Eddie's plot serving nothing to the story, and 2. The constant dialogue scenes. Also, is it me, or does Peach's voice sound a lot deeper than it was in Continental Drift? Would you get your head out of the ground for once and try to have a little fun? Yeah, I hardly recognize the place. While this was definitely better than A Mammoth Christmas, and is, in my view, the definitive Ice Age TV special, it still isn't anything to boast about. So now for what I think of all these movies and TV specials after looking back on all of them. Ice Age, amazing. Ice Age 2, not sure whether to call it the best or just as good as the previous movie. Ice Age 3, great. Ice Age 4, watchable. Ice Age 5, absolutely the worst movie I've ever seen. And as for the TV specials, A Mammoth Christmas, ruined by the rush story. The Great Escapade, better but still nothing special. With regards to this franchise, I think it ultimately comes down to what you prefer. Would you rather a poorly animated movie with an excellent story? A movie that has some interesting character dynamics and backstories? A movie with stellar animation but a not so good first third? A movie that has some issues but can still be sat through? Or a movie that just makes you want to end yourself? Nevertheless, all the ranting I did on the fifth movie, I do love this franchise. It definitely holds a special place in my heart, even after all these years. And while re-watching these movies, I actually learnt an important lesson. Never trust reviews from the press. Because sometimes, they don't know what the hell they're going on about.
family 